All right, we're back with another episode of Are You a Robot? Wow, this conversation that I just had with Paul was spectacular. If you do not know what we're doing here, let me give you a bit of background information. But before I do that, let's hear Paul's story on how he came to be where he's at. I'm Paul Nemitz uh, from the European Commission. I'm the principal advisor uh, in the European Commission on Justice Policy. And um, I spent my time in the triangle between democracy, uh, law, and technology, um, helping to uh, develop policies uh, in this space. Okay, so... Are You a Robot? This is a series where we aim to tackle some of the most pressing and challenging questions that stem from AI and related technologies. The way we're going about that is by gathering the brightest minds in their respective fields to come on here and talk with us about what it is exactly they're doing, how they see the world, where they feel energy needs to be focused as AI becomes more and more a part of our daily lives. I will mention that we do not finish the conversation here. If you would like to jump in to our Slack community, which you can find the links for below and introduce yourself. Let us know what you're working on and how you see things within the AI ethics, the data governance space, and tell us what it is that you're working on. Last but not least, I will mention we have an incredible sponsor, Ethics Grade. If you've been listening to us for a while, you know that they have been supporting us from the beginning. They have done some really cool stuff recently, so I want to mention what they've been up to. They are benchmarking. Well, let's back up a little bit. In case you don't know what they do, they are an ESG ratings company. So they measure the non-financial impact that companies have on the environment. And Ethics Grade specifically is rating the AI programs of different companies. So you can see the AI governance and the AI ethics of companies like Twitter, and you can compare them to other companies like Facebook or TikTok, whatever you would like. So if you wanna check out some of these ratings that they just put on their website, go and click the link below. It is fascinating for me to see what kind of ratings different companies have and to see there are some surprises, some companies that you think actually have really well put together ethics programs didn't get the highest rating and other companies that you wouldn't expect got higher ratings. So that's all for now with Ethics Grade. Let's jump into this conversation with Paul Nimitz. Excellent, Paul. It is great to have you on this show. I am very excited to talk to you because recently there's been some very big news in the regulation, EU regulation space for AI. And I am sure that you know just as much as I do, the documents that are set to be released in a few days have been leaked. And so I find that fascinating. I want to start there, but then I want to get into your paper and uh, what I originally planned on talking to you about. Maybe we can just get a quick blurb from you about what your feelings are on the new regulation. Did you expect this? Did you help create it? Can you give us a little bit of background? Well, uh, first of all, uh, this is not yet uh, a regulation and it's not even a proposal for the regulation because the proposal is decided by the College of Commissioners. Um, And uh, on AI, uh, you may recall that uh, President van der Leyen um, announced in the European Parliament when she took office together with the new uh, European Commission um, that uh, there would be a proposal for legislation on AI within 100 days of the Commission taking office. And this is now um, already more than a year. Uh, It's one and a half years ago. Uh, So this proposal has been postponed a number of times and has been worked hard on. And the work is still continuing. Um, It's a very, very important proposal. 
Um, and many uh, people have uh, worked on this uh, uh, inside the commission, but also uh, outside the commission. We have gone through a very intense public consultation phase. And, um, uh, you know, as you know, um, in Europe, uh, the commission only proposes legislation. What happens after the commission has made its proposal is that it will be discussed among uh, the member states uh, in the council and in the European Parliament. And then we go through what is called a co-decision procedure that both houses, the parliament and the council uh, must find majorities. Um, so this is really the beginning of yet another finding process. Let me say that on these cutting edge issues, the legislative processes in the ideal case are really uh, inspired by principles of enlightenment uh, in terms of trying to find through rational discourse and deliberation what is best uh, for our society. And this is what I hope for is going to happen also with AI. To say it very clearly, I very much hope that there will not just be blunt lobbying based on existing or future business models uh, by corporations or for that matter positions, quotation mark on and quotation mark off, taken by governments uh, without really having reflected uh, um, uh, on the matter. You know, I think AI is nothing where one can talk of national interest of this or that member state. I think what we need now um, is a very calm, uh, rational debate about how our societies, um, how democracies, um, how free societies want to live in the future and this is uh, what must determine uh, the rules we give ourselves for our life with AI. Um, and uh, I mm -hmm. think um, this challenge is something which all free societies face. So I certainly don't think that any of the rhetoric we have already been hearing about a rift uh, you know, across the Atlantic uh, uh, on this type of issue exists. In fact, I see signals right now going in the opposite direction. Uh, I think many people in America, many in academia, in civil society, in the companies, in the policymaking process in Washington, have actually understood that what is addressed in Brussels uh, by the European Commission and in the legislative discussions of which we have now many going on, because we already have on the table the proposals for the Digital Service Act, Digital Market Act, also very important, um, mm. the, uh, the Data Governance Act, um, all these discussions address issues which people and companies and science and civil society in free societies face together and to the same extent. So um, that's my greatest wish for this proposal, that we don't fall into old patterns, um, but that we really try um, to act according to the insight that this is not about technology in the first place. This is societal policy, digital policy, AI policy, internet policy is societal policy. Um, and that's why uh, also I would say many more than just uh, the techno-scientific complex have to get engaged on this. Uh -huh. Fascinating points that you raised there around the idea that we need to have this conversation for society, not just for this small subset of society. This is a much larger issue and it shouldn't be looked at as just a technological conversation. So I am, I have my own thoughts on this question and I just wanted to propose it to you because someone this morning went uh, in one of the communities that I'm in, specifically around machine learning operations, they, I, there's a thread going on about the implications of the new uh, proposed regulations. And these, the question is, why would the EU want to invest and at the same time put a heavy restriction on the use cases, limiting the use cases for machine learning? Uh, and so it's like, from this person's point of view, they thought that, wow, why wouldn't you let the ecosystem thrive and become the leader and then put regulation on it? I have my own 
disagreements with that question, but I would love to hear how you would answer that. Well, I would say that um, uh, in Europe we have a, a long history of um, uh, democracy uh, um, helping to guide uh, uh, innovativeness. And a part of this history is to challenge uh, academia and innovators and industry to go in a certain direction. And I give you a practical example. Um, when it is about um, sustainability and air quality, we have a long history of setting emission standards, like a little bit like California has done it, setting emission standards, which at the time of the legislator deciding are actually impossible to reach. But through setting these very challenging standards, we guide industry to go in a direction which is uh, sustainable. And this is not about hindering this innovation. This is about moving the energy of innovation and the capital which is necessary for innovation in a direction which is both uh, uh, um, uh, profitable and you know, fine if industry makes money on it, but it's also um, in the public interest and, and leads to a sustainable world. And I think this is the challenge we are now facing uh, with all the new technologies, um, not only those which pollute uh, the air and create external environmental costs. New technologies create a lot of external costs and uh, we have to learn, like we did it um, uh, and we are continuing to do it on environmental sustainability, to, let's say, direct innovation and the related capital and brain power of people in a direction which is in the public interest, which is good for society, good for uh, fundamental rights, good for uh, productivity and growth. Um, as um, the experience shows that, um, and this is not a new experience in the Internet age, that uh, the market alone and capitalism alone is not going this way. And so I would answer to your friend uh, uh, who says, why are they putting uh, uh, all these restrictions? This is not about hindering innovation, but this is showing to those who are capable to innovate what innovation society would like to see. And that's why it's so important to go through this democratic process. Mm. We cannot leave the shaping of society only to powers which are powers of money, powers of capital, powers of markets. But we live in a democracy and the important issues in our democracies must, I would say, not only be co-shaped, but there must ex actually at the end, if you mean it with democracy, be a certain primacy of democracy over technology. And it is perfectly okay that in a democratic process, a society expresses its orientations and wishes for where innovation should actually go. So I would say um, those who uh, are in the techno-scientific complex, the technical intelligentsia, they are very much needed in this process. They should re-engage with democracy and not fight against it. Um, um, you know, we, we need the knowledge of the technical intelligentsia more than ever before. They, uh, the technical intelligentsia has become much more powerful also in terms of numbers, uh, you know, the engineers and programmers and so on, in terms of numbers in our societies have become much more. But at the same time, uh, let's say their engagement and presence in societal um, structures where decisions are made on laws and, you know, on what our d democracy wants has actually gone down significantly. In my book, um, I have... A, you know, research these statistics and, uh, you know, we find, I think, eight um, engineers in the U.S. Congress, but we find 208 uh, lawyers and I think around 200 businessmen. And the same in the wow. German parliament to take the same example, um, you know, you can see since the 1990s that the share of engineers and programmers and also you know, scientists, um, you know, physicists and so on has continually decreased. And I'm worried about this. I think it's important uh, at this time uh, um, where technology becomes so ubiquitous and so important that um, those who are in the technological area and know about technology re-engage positively with democracy. 
Do you feel like they're not in democracy because there is much more money to be made in the private sector? Well, I don't think it's it's about money, but um, um, I think the um, the rules according to which systems are built and uh, also the rules according to which careers are made in business and in technology are fundamentally different from those uh, how things uh, work in, 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 let's say, um, social contexts and, and in, 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 in democracy. And I think with the success of digital technologies and uh, the success of the corporations which have uh, uh, spread uh, these technologies around the world, um, comes an engineering view of the world and a belief that everything in this world would be better if we would just apply the engineering rules of technology also to democracy. And I think that is a huge fallacy. And I would like to give you one example why I think this is a fallacy. Democracy has the function uh, to control power and to separate power. And that's why we have very complex systems of divisions of power in Europe between the European Union and its member states and then the regions in the member states and local uh, authorities, you know, cities and so on. But we also have a division of power and democracy between the legislative branch, the executive, the judiciary, and of course the press as the force as state. And we're doing this, these checks and balances, to be sure that not one center of power can overwhelm the others. But in business and in technology, it is perfectly legitimate to strive for a very strong, well-functioning, controlled system. Um, you know, some of the most successful business models are closed gardens. They are controlled very tightly by the corporation. And of course, the corporations try to overwhelm as much as they can. They try to overwhelm the competition. And they are trying also, in some cases, to overwhelm politics and to overwhelm the democratic decision-making process. And, you know, I have no problem with legitimate forms of lobbying, um, but I think uh, there is a problem in the thinking that the logic of markets, of capitalism, and of technology, in terms of striving for dominance, um, that that is a logic which we should also follow in the democratic process. In the democratic process, we do exactly the opposite. We divide our power to avoid overwhelming. And so I would just suggest that to remember this and let's say to not only be a good technologist and good businessman, but also a good citizen of democracy, it would be good if um, uh, the engineering uh, scene re-engages more uh, constructively uh, with democracy and recognizes and celebrates these differences of how decisions are made. And um, I, as I said initially, I think our democracies are dependent today on the knowledge which comes from uh, engineers, uh, programmers, and those who know these technologies and these business models. We cannot only rely on what the companies tell us because sometimes they don't tell us the truth. We need the people to engage, and we need the people to be ready also to go through the pains of democracy in terms of compromising and so on. These are all severe pains, <laughs> and I have sympathy for those who say, oh, you know, I don't want to do this to me. Uh, you know, I have other <laughs> things to do in my life. But if all the good people say this, then we are lacking the skills which in a democracy must be present. Uh, uh, in the democratic decision making, namely the skills of the engineers and technologists. Yes, I completely agree with you on that. The need for the subject matter experts is so great. And I love how you put that. We are making sure everybody has to go through these pains. I know it's very easy to just run out and say, ah, oh, no, I don't want to deal with that because. It is too painful to have to deal with a democracy in that way or to have to interface with democracy. But like you said, we need these subject matter experts to 
be involved because without them, we are going to be missing an important piece of the picture. So last question on this whole new EU stuff, and then we'll jump into what I originally wanted to talk to you about. Do you feel like there was anything that was missing when this uh, proposed regulation came out? Is there anything that you would have liked to have seen on there? Well, as I said uh, uh, originally, um, uh, the regulation is not yet out and uh, not even the proposal is out. It's only out uh, when the College of Commissioners has decided. Um, and many have um, participated in this. So uh, I, I think we had a very um, rational uh, process, um, you know, including very big public consultations and married, many people inside the commission engaged on this. Um, and also in other uh, fora engaged on this. So um, I think we have to see this proposal as part of the overall package of our digital strategy and our strategy for democracy. Um, and it is a, a, a proposal which will certainly um, still uh, gain uh, in importance uh, in the um, legislative process uh, which follows on. So, uh, you know, I think um, it's good that every proposal of the commission is not just becoming a law immediately, but goes through this finding process um, of democracy. And I look forward to, uh, you know, the new ideas and improvements which may then come through the de uh, um, um, uh, democratic debate. I look forward to that very optimistically. Um, and I would say what the commission puts on the table is certainly an excellent starting point for that uh, societal discourse to take place. Mm. I really like how you frame that. This is a sub this is part of the whole package. And knowing that it's not to be looked at as an island. It's to be looked at in conjuncture to all of these other pieces that are coming into play. And that really puts things into perspective also. And it's it's very interesting the idea that you mentioned beforehand too about how what we're doing here is we're getting more people involved to say how we would like technology to advance. It's not just the companies who are creating these, this technology. It's a society, as a society, we are getting a say in how this goes forward. So I appreciate the, the viewpoints and now we can, we can forget about that and move on to your incredible paper that is the uh, Constitutional Democracy and Technology in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. I would love to get a bit of background on why you wanted to create this paper and uh, if you can summarize it in a way. I know it's, uh, it's quite an intense paper. You probably spent a lot of man hours creating it, but a brief summary about the paper, and then we'll dive into some specific points that I had. Yes, so this is a paper uh, uh, I wrote in 2018 for a collection of articles on uh, the challenges of AI, uh, which was uh, to be published by the Royal Society in the United Kingdom. And um, I had been uh, at the time uh, just um, finished, let's say more or less, uh, with the project of putting in place the GDPR. I was the lead director in the Commission on the General Data Protection Regulation, um, which was already um, a legislation on uh, the relationship between technology and the new possibilities technology gave to collect and use personal data on the one hand, uh, and um, the individual right to um, informational self-determination, data protection and privacy uh, on the other hand, keeping in mind that this individual right for people is also a very important right in an institutional way for democracy because democracy cannot exist uh, without an individual personal space of privacy and uh, without personal data being protected. And uh, 
So, um, you know, having been going through this process of six years of uh, negotiations and discourse on uh, technology and, and fundamental rights and democracy and seeing AI uh, uh, on the horizon, I, I, I was thinking, you know, what does the future hold? And um, um, what I saw was a lot of ethics uh, debates uh, on AI. And I was asking myself, well, is ethics actually enough for this technology, which will be a power technology and which to a large extent is developed by the, the big tech companies um, and which was and is very likely to add to the dominance of uh, these companies even further um, if we don't um, act on this. And so my article in the first place is about rehabilitating the law uh, as the most noble expression of uh, the democratic will um, and making clear that it is simply uh, not enough uh, to talk about ethics uh, for technology. We need in this technological age to regulate um, technology by law. I think that was uh, the first message. And why by law? Because first, law has the legitimacy of democracy. Um, it's not just, you know, I choose this ethics, I choose that, that ethics, and I decide myself whether I comply or not, but law is obligatory, um, it, and that's why it needs to have this um, democratic legitimacy. Mm. But second also, very important in this world of ever more technological power concentrated in particular in these big corporations, the law can be enforced against everybody, including against um, technological power. So uh, this is what this uh, paper is about, essentially. And then it sets out, um, let's say, all the different um, um, more concrete mutations uh, of this sort. And um, it appeals to the responsibility of the engineers. It sets out that we need to invest much more in technology impact assessment on three levels. Uh, namely, uh, we need, uh, of course, an impact assessment in uh, in democratic fora, in in uh, in, in, in parliaments, we need the companies to take responsibility who put AI on the market, um, that they do impact assessments. And this impact assessment must not only relate to the environment or safety, which are the traditional forms of impact assessments, but you know, given that um, AI combined with personal data collection and the internet um, becomes a, a technology of nudging people of uh, being able to move whole com countries and democracies in a certain direction, we need impact assessments also uh, on the impact of this technology related to democracy, rule of law, and fundamental rights. Um, and um, so this paper, I would say, what was its, its achievement at the end? Um, it was downloaded more than 20,000 times uh, from the Royal Society website. And I think it was a very important building stone in moving the discussion forward from ethics talk to legal action. And uh, this is how we now arrived um, at the legislative proposal and at the willingness um, um, of uh, both uh, the initiator of legislation in Europe, namely the European Commission, but also uh, the willingness of parliaments and member states to actually adopt binding law uh, on this matter. I think um, that was the ambition at the time, and I'm very happy how um, things have developed since the paper was published. So you talk about the new culture of incorporating the principles into democracy, and you were saying there's this these three levels, uh, the three-level technological impact assessment. Can we dive into that a little bit more? Uh, and what exactly is needed for this new culture to be embraced? So the three levels of uh, impact assessment and understanding of what the technology actually means are the following. First, politics and especially legislators, uh, but also executives which make proposals for legislation must have an understanding of impact of technology on society. And they must equip themselves uh, with this knowledge. And to be very clear, this cannot just mean asking the companies, you know, we'll invite Zuckerberg uh, uh, before the U.S. Congress or the, uh, the European Parliament, because experience shows 
that companies don't tell us the full picture. They don't tell us the truth. They have business secrets. Sometimes also they lie. So we must develop new mechanisms to understand technology and we must invest in this. Um, the second level is the company responsibility. Those companies which want to pursue a sustainable profit business model where they can be sure not to be derailed uh, uh, is that they need to, imp to understand the impact of their technology in society. Because if they don't, uh, they run the risk that things go terribly wrong and that, of course, has an impact on the stock market. And, uh, you know, you can, if you look at the stock market uh, fluctuations of some of the big tech companies, you can very clearly see the dent uh, in the stock market development uh, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the price development of the stock when certain things have happened. So I would say it is in the enlightened self-interest of corporations uh, developing new technologies to understand the impact and the risks they are creating from intended and unintended use of these very powerful technologies. But it's also a societal responsibility of the companies to do this, and that's why I think it is legitimate to oblige them by law to do it. They should do it from a business point of view, but you know, we, the reality shows that um, they are often free riders. Uh, they yeah, don't they do... Want to do yes. And the third level is the individual. The individual must have the ability and must be empowered to understand first of all that he or she is dealing with AI. <laughs> I mean, that must be clear in all moments when you talk to a voice and you are not certain you know, is this a human or is this a machine? You must be put on notice. And the same is true in text. Um, we cannot live in a society where, you know, in the morning we look at our uh, mobile phone and we see all these messages and articles, you know, supporting this or that candidate for political office and we don't know anymore, are these messages actually sent by real people? Is this a picture of democratic discourse or is this just great machines who produce all this? So first, we must be put on notice that a machine is acting here, an automated uh, decision-making system, in decisions in terms of texts. And second, uh, we must understand what the use of this machine means for us in terms of impacts on our interests and our rights. So mm, um, in this approach... I have been very much inspired by what is already in the GDPR. GDPR says that if you process personal data, meaning data which identifies an individual or makes it possible to identify an individual, then you have to do what we call in the legislation a data um, a protection impact assessment. And you also have the duty to give the information to individuals when you goes through um, uh, automated decision-making processes with personal data, um, uh, which empowers the individual to understand what this process means for him or her. So what we have done here for personal data, um, in the article basically I say this needs to be generalized for AI. We need to go beyond uh, just personal data, but if these systems are used, um, people, uh, also individually, must understand what the system in question uh, now uh, means for him or her in terms of uh, potential impacts on their life, on uh, opportunities, and on decision-taking. So under that first level that you spoke about, the executives, and you mentioned at the end of the point you were making that there's there needs to be new mechanisms to understand this kind of tech and invest in it. We need to invest in these new mechanisms. Is there anything that you feel there's a, like what are some of these new mechanisms, I guess is the main thing? Well, I mean, this is uh, what I'm saying here and I have explained this all in detail in my book Prinzip Mensch, Macht, Freiheit und Demokratie im Zeitalter der künstlichen Intelligenz. Uh, in English one would say the human imperative, uh, power, uh, liberty and democracy in the age of artificial intelligence. 
Uh, what I'm saying here is that we have to read um, Hans Jonas, the, the great philosopher um, Hans Jonas' uh, a book uh, on the imperative of responsibility uh, into the future. And what did Jonas mm. say in, in the 1970s when uh, the big debate was about atomic power um, and about disarmament or armament, uh, uh, you know, still in the Cold War between East and West in, in Europe? He said that we have a duty to invest in a new type of science which allows us to understand the long-term implications of technology on mankind and the way we live as humans. Um, and we must invest in this from two directions. First, we must try to understand, so basically assemble the scientific expertise to predict uh, as good as possible. But second, we must also create um, the preconditions so that we're able to take the political decisions and maybe the hard decisions, which are necessary today to avoid possible long-term, very negative consequences for humanity. And um, uh, so basically what, what, uh, what I take from this is that we have to take this complex of impact assessment uh, much more serious. And I make uh, in my book then also uh, uh, very uh, practical proposals for this. I, I, I give you one example. I think, for example, we need a new class of engineers uh, who mm. study already at the university uh, their technological fantasies uh, and technological imagination. So we, we must have people who understand you know, the technological at hand and then who are trained like a lawyer is trained to anticipate future conflicts and make contract rules to avoid or at least regulate these future contracts, uh, these future conflicts, we need these engineers to be trained in possible uses of these capabilities to understand them and then relate them to how societies function. Namely, these engineers must also be trained to to learn how democracy functions, how the rule of law functions, how fundamental rights function, and bring these two elements together, namely technological imagination and what does it mean for society, for individuals. So not only what does it mean for nature and sustainability and safety, um, but also what does it mean for these forms of social organization of humans, because the technologies which we're now talking about, like AI, are technologies which go very deep into our individual lives and our social lives. They make a difference on how we organize society. So that is um, uh, one angle. And the other angle, and this is uh, something about the cultural change, I would think we have to remind ourselves um, of... Uh, let's say, the great philosophers and sociologists, uh, which have already once um, exercised uh, this type uh, of debate, uh, namely after the Second World War. And if we have the time, I'd, I'd like to read out a text for you, um, which is not mine, and which I only discovered after having uh, finished the book, um, but which uh, is surprisingly addressing the issue which we are discussing. Please do. Yes, and it's from... Uh, I, you War. can guess. A world right. where technology occupies such a key position as it does nowadays produces technological people who are attuned to technology. This has its good reason. In their own narrow field, they will be less likely to be fooled, and that can also affect the overall situation. On the other hand, there is something exaggerated, irrational, pathogenic in the present-day relationship to technology. This is connected with the veil of technology. People are inclined to take technology to be the thing itself as an end in itself, a force of its own, and they forget that it is an extension of human dexterity. The means... And technology is the epitome of the means of self-preservation of the human species are fetishized 
because the ends, a life of human dignity, are concealed and removed from the consciousness of people. As long as one formulates this as generally as I just did, it should provide insight. But such a hypothesis is still much too abstract. It is by no means clear precisely how the fetishization of technology establishes itself within the individual psychology of particular people or where the threshold lies between a rational relationship to technology and the overvaluation that finally leads to the point where one who cleverly devises a train system that brings the victims to Auschwitz as quickly and smoothly as possible forgets about what happens to them there. End of the quote. So wow. this text if, if basically... If didn't have that last sentence... Yes. Sorry, go well, ahead. This text... Um, is from 1966. Uh, it's a, a part of the very famous text of Theodor Adorno on the education after Auschwitz. But it shows us um, that the issue of relationship between technology and society and the duty of engineers to think beyond their technology and to ask questions and to take responsibility is not new. So um, what I would say, uh, and that was part of uh, the effort of my book, um, is um, you know we have to also look back into how humans have exercised their reason and their, their minds uh, uh, in the past. We are not living in a world which is... Um, and should be uh, forgetting all the thinking about human self-organization, which has been developing uh, since the Greek and Roman uh, civilizations. And um, we should also not think that the future is shaped alone by technology. In the COVID crisis right now, we see mm. very clearly that an, as the ability of societies to give themselves rules and to organize themselves um, is key and that uh, technology is only part of this organization. So, you know, in this great enthusiasm for technology and code and, um, you know, making our children able to program and to write code, well, I would say we also need to re-educate re ourselves and our children in language, how to read and how to write. We need to re-educate ourselves and our children in reading the great texts of the philosophers and sociologists. And we also must relearn how democracy works and we must relearn to engage uh, in democracy as, let's say, a very different form of getting things done than uh, getting things done through technology. I think the piece you shared is timeless because if it didn't have that last sentence, I would have thought it was written yesterday. It's well, that is the sign of greatness. Uh, you know, that is the sign of yeah. greatness of great philosophers and sociologists that e they may have said things, um, you know, 50 or 100 or 1,000 years ago, but it still has a meaning today. And that is one of the differences of language uh, to code. You yeah. see, code needs an update every eight weeks because it is written mm -hmm. for stupids. And who are the stupids? The stupids are the computers. So if something goes wrong, we need the update. But human rules and good legislation and good constitutions they are written in language, in human language. And they can be written in a way which I call technology neutral, which enables us humans to apply our own thinking to these rules. So we, in contrast to computers, have the ability to think ourselves. And when wow. we find language yeah. before us which expresses rules in a technologically neutral way, 
we can interpret these rules as the progress of technology and business models require. And this is exactly what the law does. But to be able to do this, we have to recognize that legislation is not code. It's a very different thing. And the ability of thinking themselves is a unique ability of humans, which distinguishes humans from computers. And the ability to be open to future reinterpretation without a text change is a great strength of language, which is not given to code. Wow. That is such an important point that I've never thought about. We can have text from thousands of years ago that can still ring true to us today. And with code, you there's a whole movement about continuous delivery. The faster you can ship something, the better, because you don't want it to get stale. So that's brilliant. I'm going to probably reuse that one in other conversations that I have because it's the first time that I've I've had that point been made on myself. And so it's like, ooh, cool. Thank you for that. Uh, jumping back into this paper that you're talking about. And well, I guess maybe before we do that, there is a lingering question that I have in, in what you said, which is, humans can reinterpret and we can think for ourselves and computers cannot. Do you feel like it is possible at some point in time, computers will be able to interpret, reinterpret and think for themselves? Well, certainly not uh, on the basis of present um, AI uh, 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 um, theories and developments, which are based on the use of data, which are empirical. Why? Uh, will this never lead to this type of thinking of humans? Because we know from philosophy uh, that you cannot conclude to what should be, namely to what be, should be changed in society uh, or in practices which you are right now following, from the empirics about these practices. So you cannot conclude from what is what is to what should be. But Present AI models, and doesn't matter which one, are based entirely on past empirics. They can maybe optimize the use and understanding of these past empirics. But what they are missing is the dreams humans have, the imagination humans have about, and, and also the discontent humans have about the present. And all this, the discontent from you know, for example, doing something the way we do it over and over again and, you know, saying, oh God, you know, this is not right, we should do it better. The dreams and our ability to imagine something which really doesn't exist. Um, all this is what drives uh, matters forward and, and this is where, um, you know, the language and the openness of the language and our ability to reinterpret language comes in. You know, I think we have to rehabilitate this ability of the human being, we have to stop talking down the humans as just, you know, a creature which is not perfect and AI is so much more perfect. I mean, hello, that's no news. You know, a horse already in Roman times was running faster uh, uh, than the human and that's why we were riding horses and not just running. Um, so uh, on specific abilities, technology has always, uh, you know, and tools have always been used to overtake the human. But what this technology certainly doesn't deliver for now is this element of dreams, imagination, and moving from discontent with the present to a better future. Um, and I'm actually a little bit worried that as modern as AI, AI may sound, it may lock us into the past. Because you know, these programs always based on past empirics. Where do they bring the impetus to make the world better, which we need so dearly? Where do they bring the impetus for rep reform? I am not sure, for example, how democracy is going to function 
if we imagine an executive, uh, you know, all the ministries in the future automized in AI based on past empirics. So a new government comes in, wants to change things, and how is that going to work? Uh, you know, it's all been programmed, it's all um, been yeah. uh, billions of dollars invested in all these AI programs which do it one way, and then you want to have political change. Now you basically need to retrain and discuss with your civil servants, and the human flexibility will move them to do things differently, hopefully. And the technology, how is that going to work? Uh, it's going to cost incredible amounts of money. It's going to be, uh, you know, maybe a huge amount of time. Maybe it will never work. So um, there is an element of conservatism uh, in AI type of thinking, um, which is not going to lead us to a better world. Another huge point made there that we cannot use AI to outsource this idea of our imagination and our will to change. We can't act like that's going to happen through AI because it can only look at the past. It can only look at the data which has come through and the data itself is only from past events. Wow. So let's go into this idea that you spoke about earlier of the new type of engineer that you would like to see. And the new type of engineer that you would like to see is someone that is playing out all of the possible scenarios in their head because they have a more in-depth understanding of the technology and they also have the imagination of how this technology, where it could go. Is this something that you see as its own discipline or is it something that you see as being mandatory in all of engineering curriculums? No, I don't think this needs to be mandatory in all engineering curriculums, but um, I think uh, when we um, require impact assessments to be carried out by technology um, developers, we need the people who can do this. And the answer today is that you know a good impact assessment is done by a team which is interdisciplinary. And I think you know that's part of the answer. But the reality is that the technology becomes so complex that I'm worried that the interdisciplinary nature is just uh, of work is just not enough. I think we need um, engineers who really have gone through a very deep study of technology um, and have learned, uh, let's say, the toolbox of technological imagination. And, and that is a new type of study. Already that uh, is something which I think is not, you know, the, imagine, the imagination of capabilities and use of a technology is not um, a, a very um, big part of teaching at, at, or is not taught actually at, at many um, faculties. And then we need this ability of seamlessly relating these uh, potentialities and, and imagined capabilities to uh, impacts in society. Um, so we already have studies which uh, train uh, engineers to look at impacts on the environment or on safety, but this needs to be enlarged to societal impacts, impacts on the rule of law, impacts on individual rights. And I would say this should be um, an offer um, which people can choose, not an obligatory uh, thing. But uh, I'm quite optimistic that people will choose it because this will become a required profession. You know, if the law says you must carry out such an impact assessment, the next step may be one day, and I would be in favor of this, that the law says, and this uh, impact assessment must be certified by a qualified engineer of democracy. This is how, you know, I, I would give it, let's say, a working title. I would call them engineer mm -hmm. of democracy. Namely, a new class of academics who bring together in their education a deep understanding of technology and a deep understanding of the impact of this technology in our society. And that they are called upon then, like auditors, you know, certain 
auditing task can only be done by qualified mm. auditors or like lawyers, you know, certain tasks in law can only be done by qualified lawyers, um, that they are then called upon exclusively to carry out this very important function of certifying impact assessments. So we all know that the truth is stranger than fiction. How does the fact that we're never going to be able to see everything play into that? It plays uh, uh, into it uh, uh, in the same way that we know that everything in our life is imperfect. We know that the law is imperfect because there is neither any law uh, which is perfect nor is any law perfectly uh, enforced. And we know that love is not perfect. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we have ideal ideas and can't call them regulatory ideas, but we know that reality never reaches this uh, um, 100%. So um, I think, of course, we have to content with our, ourselves with um, what we are able to do. But I would say, uh, if we plan and intend uh, uh, to further develop uh, the skills of engineers to reflect about future use of technology intended or unintended for the purpose of impact assessment, and if this becomes uh, a goal of uh, 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 corporations and of academia and of politics, then we will get better at it. You know, we will get better at it as we get normally better at any skill where we say we want to learn this. And I would say, you know, the time has come to get better at this so that the great accidents which we have seen in the technological world over and over again, where we normally only learn from disasters, um, you know, is improved. We now live in a world where technology moves so fast that we cannot afford to wait for the disaster because, you know, the future disasters, they may be such that they are irreversible. So, you know, mm -hmm. let's not lean back on this, but take up this challenge and try to make a better uh, uh, world in terms of, you know, trying to look more forward and I use the word, you know, let's invest in precaution where we have very, very powerful uh, technologies which are supposed to be all-purpose technologies, which are supposed to be as ubiquitous as electricity, um, but of which we already know today that they can be hugely abused. And we need to prepare for that and we need to avoid it. Excellent. I want to thank you so much, Paul, for coming on here. You've opened my mind by talking to me just for an hour. I can't imagine what it would be like to have a full dinner conversation with you. It's been absolutely brilliant to hear your way of thinking and also the wisdom that you're bringing from all of this that you've written, all of this that you've you've studied in the past and and your new viewpoints on things. It's Absolutely incredible. I have one last question for you, Paul. Are you a robot? <laughs> well, uh, uh, no. I'm a genuine, as human as you can imagine, reading literature and loving. Amazing. Well, thank you so much again, and we will talk to you later, hopefully. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.